Uh, and like I said, feel free as we go on, if you've got any kind of questions you want to put in the chat, some of them I might come back to at the end, but feel free to kind of chip in in the chat, chat as well. OK, so I've got three main aims for this um, workshop. The first is kind of to talk a bit about kind of the science of sleep, um, some of the research around sleep um, and particularly during the teen years, because all sorts of challenges can pop up um, and get quite a lot worse sometimes during the teen years. For lots of different reasons. Uh, often when we talk about sleep or you Google kind of what helps with sleep, you'll get a long list. Um, but actually, I think for young people, it's often really helpful to know why some things are being recommended. So the hopes to kind of give you some insight as well as parents of kind of what's behind some of the recommendations and also to try and give you um, some information that's just a bit beyond some of the things that might come across as quite common sense to actually talk about why certain things are recommended or um, some extra kind of tips and tools for you to know about. Um, so very much this second part is, like I said, to give you some kind of resources and ideas for supporting your teen with sleep. Um, so some of you might be parents of teens who are in year seven, some who might be in year 11 or potentially even sixth form. And obviously the needs of those young people are going to be very different. Um, and you might have, let's say, more say over a young person in some ways who's in year seven or eight. Uh, and their kind of sleep routine, whereas a young person in year 11 um, is going to be quite different. So my hope very much is to kind of give you ideas that you might that might play to you. So things that you can talk about with your teen, things that you can suggest, routines you can try and put in place and some tools and resources that you can go away with as well. Um, just to say that the hope is next year is that um, this very similar to this workshop will actually be delivered in schools in their PSHE uh, lessons designed by us to young people themselves. So to try and get them on board with some of these ideas as well. So we're trying to come from both angles, information, advice, kind of support for parents, but also for the young people themselves. Um, and then I suppose the final bit is obviously we've got summer coming up and summer can be um, a great time for many, but it's also one where we could, young people might completely in some ways be at risk of losing a sleep routine and then really struggle when they get back to September. Um, so we also wanted to think about actually what young people are doing over summer and give you some resources as pa parents for how you might support or kind of think about supporting their well-being. And actually by supporting their daytime well-being, often that helps with their sleep too. OK, so let's get started. Uh, so first part, a brief introduction to some sleep science and research. So I've got a few pictures here. So if we think as a uh, kind of society about all the messages that we sometimes might be giving young people around sleep, um, it's very much we've got a lot of focus and a lot of intention on productivity. Um, in many ways, that's a really good thing. But we've also got that clashing with the idea that sleep might, some people viewing sleep as a waste of time. Um, and actually, when you speak to young people during exam periods, they might be telling each other or comparing how they pulled an all nighter, as in didn't sleep and carried on revising. Um, you've got young people comparing sometimes how many Red Bulls or energy drinks they've had in the daytime. Uh, but this has a long history. There's a lot of, you know, going right back to Thomas Edison. Sleep is a criminal waste of time and a heritage from our cave days. Uh, article before too long ago, um, how Elon Musk succeeds on four hours of sleep per night, and these were put forward as ideals. Thankfully, Elon Musk has kind of come out recently in an article and saying that his mental health and whole state of mind really deteriorated on four nights of sleep, um, and actually he's getting more sleep now. But I suppose what I'm hoping to get across in this workshop as well is to really break this idea, because actually we now know so much science about how important sleep is and for productivity, as opposed to it being a waste of time and drain on productivity. So we'll talk through that as we go through. OK, so what do we know about the consequences of poor sleep? So we know that it really impairs our cognitive performance. Actually, concentration by a really significant degree, degree decreases um, following poor sleep. And that's both kind of, um, yeah, that's having a night's poor sleep kind of and ongoing poor sleep will kind of have an increased effect on concentration. It reduces our problem solving, it reduces our creativity and productivity. And this is both for teenagers, children and adults. And for many of you, that might not be surprising. Uh, it reduces our mood, um, creates irritability, lower mood and our over time feeds into anxiety. Uh, increases our emotional dysregulation and we might notice that when we've had poorer sleep, we're more snappy or moody and we talk about some of the science behind that. Um, and probably because of that and all those things, it then can have an impact on relationships and especially if kind of um, 
it carries on and it's not just a kind of one off poor night's sleep. So there we go. Straight away, we've got some quite significant consequences of poor sleep. Um, the thing is, some of your teenagers might not know all this and actually saying that there's some science, and I'll go in a bit more in detail about some of the science, um, can be quite illuminating for young people asking them kind of, you know, if we don't sleep well or we're doing these things, it does have a knock on effect. Um, and what do you think those knock on effects are? OK, and then over time, we also now know that there's a lot of consequences on physical health. Um, our immune system, our heart functioning, lots of organ functioning is really influenced by sleep. Um, again, many of you might know that already, but just to kind of make it really clear that that's very much um, evidence now. OK, in 1964, um, a chap called Randy Gardner um, did an experiment where he decided for some reason to go for the world record of the number of days where he didn't sleep. Um, and again, this is just a kind of takeaway set of facts that might be helpful for young people to kind of know about um, that actually just how bad and how quickly poor sleep can affect you. On day two, he couldn't keep his eyes open. He couldn't repeat simple tongue twisters. Um, I don't think many people ask you tongue twisters nowadays, but just an example of a cognitive kind of effect on our ability to do normal tasks. Day three, he was actually physically uncoordinated um, and noticeably moody by all those around him. On day five, he started hallucinating. Um, and on day 11, 50, 25 minutes, uh, which is how long he lasted, he was hospitalised. He did recover, but it took quite a long time to recover. Um, but it really shows that actually poor sleep will over time very quickly have a really significant impact. Um, when we've missed 15 to 19 hours, uh, our behaviour acts like our blood alcohol level 0.5, um, which is essentially the same as being drunk. Um, and that's 50% slower reaction time and severely reduced performance. So young people might have the idea that if I pour an all nighter and keep doing that, especially over an exam period, I might perform better. Well, no. And actually the learning side of actually sleep really helps us process information um, really is shown it's, it's just not accurate and there's no evidence to support that, even though it's kind of commonly thought about. OK, I'm going to move to a bit more science about the part around irritability and why that happens. Um, so some of you might have heard we've got a part of our brain um, called the amygdala, which is part of our limbic system. Um, it's called the amygdala because it, apparently it looks a bit like an almond and it's quite deep in our brain. If you have heard about it before, it's kind of like the easiest way to think about it is it's our brain's kind of threat alarm system. Um, and some people say it's kind of part of our old brain or kind of it's quite it's kind of quite a primitive part of our brain. So it's fair to detect threats and part of it is it's fair to detect threats and react to it. Um, and that's where we get our kind of fight flight, freeze response, which some of you might have, hear about. It's essentially, if we sense danger, we're going to act really emotionally to try and fight against that danger and manage it. And it's a very quick response. It's a very immediate response. It's a very often snappy response. Um, and the research that has been done is they had two groups of people. One group essentially had a good night's sleep. The other group of people had a really, they made them have a bad night's sleep. And then they showed both sets of people some emotional pictures and saw what happened in their amygdala. And what they found is that those who had a really bad night's sleep had 60% higher amygdala reactivity. It was going off 60% more for those who had a good night's sleep, which means they were far more reactive, far more fight and flight response, basically because of one night's poor sleep. And that just shows kind of this irritability and moodiness side. It's got a brain basis to it. It's actually our brains are reacting a lot more to anything that could be perceived as a danger. Stress about exams, mum or dad asking me to do something, friendship difficulties makes you a lot more snappy. And partly that's the reason why. The other thing they found is that um, our frontal lobes so the front of our brains a lot to do with kind of what they say. It's like the CEO of our brain. So it kind of tells other parts what to do in a way. It helps you problem solve. It helps you think things through. It helps you reflect. Um, so all these things that would help us when we're feeling a bit emotional go, actually, am I acting sensibly here? Um, what can I do to help? What solutions can I come up with? So that's kind of part of what that brain part front bit of a brain's meant to be most involved with. And they also found that the communication between the front part and this amygdala part um, 
there is a lot less communication after a bad night's sleep. So essentially you are less in control of your emotion. You are more emotionally reactive and you are less in control of your emotions after just one night's bad sleep. So I think there's some information that's probably quite helpful and probably help quite helpful for young people know is that your brain's going to be on overdrive and reacting to stuff so much more, not because it's your fault, but just because that's what poor sleep does to you after even one night's bad sleep. Um, and that's the case for all of us. So I'm not saying don't blame, blame, blame ourselves or a young person when we're sleep deprived, but there's a reason why we are more moody and irritable. Um, I hope that's clear enough. I hope that do mention in the chat if it didn't, wasn't clear enough. Um, so there we go. Um, so that's just a bit of kind of what happens behind behind the um, behind the picture. I put this picture on before um, called flipping the lid because that is basically some of you might have heard that analogy. Old brain amygdala, frontal lobe. Ideally, when we're functioning well and doing OK, they're talking to each other. When we flip our lids, they stop talking to each other and we're acting on impulse. But actually what this study says is kind of is suggesting is that when we sleep badly, we're a lot less in control of our emotions and we're a lot more reactive. OK. Let's go beyond the brain. So previously, there was a lot of thinking that actually our sleep is impacted by our mental health, um, which is true. And there is evidence to support that. But what we also know, and partly why as a mental health professional, we wanted to kind of put on a session like this, is because we also really know that sleep also really affects our mental health. So it's both directions. So if we're thinking about how we're doing on our well-being, we also need to think about our sleep. And there actually there's some quite simple things we can do to support sleep, which we'll go into in a minute. OK, so nice quote. Sleep is the most powerful form of self-care that we have. Um, and we pay nowhere near attention, in my opinion, to our sleep, which we do for at least hopefully about a third of our day. Um, and there's lots of functions of it. So like we said before, actually, it really underlies learning, attention, information processing and memory. So one of the ideas is actually our sleep kind of helps us process the day and it helps us learn what we need to take away from our day. Um, so it's almost a way to clear out or ideally it's a way to clear out what's happened in the day. Think, work out it kind of in our dreams might help kind of work out what's what's kind of um, come up with creative solutions or kind of ways to process what happens, kind of get you ready and fresh and kind of uh, for the next day. Ideally, that's what kind of healthy sleep does. Um, as well as if you've been studying for exams, apparently, or kind of the evidence is it also helps process that information and consolidate those memories. Um, so that's what it means, kind of cognitive and physical restoration as well. So kind of our stress levels over the course of sleep usually will decrease. Um, uh, and through those processes and all the parts of sleep that are still a bit of a mystery, um, there's so much evidence that it protects and promotes our both mental health and our physical health. Okay, so now we're going to go more into uh, the four parts of sleep. So, and start to talk about teenagers as well in particular. Okay, amount, the numbers of sleep. So that's one part of a sleep story. Uh, timing is when we get to sleep. Quality, how refreshing or restorative is our sleep? Um, some of you might have heard there's kind of four different um, stages of sleep. Uh, one of them being REM or rapid eye movement sleep, where your eyes are flickering. Um, I don't know if people have seen that before. That's what your eyes do um, in a certain stage of sleep. Uh, but also your state of mind. So your people's thoughts and beliefs about sleep and their experience of it. So we're going to pay attention to all of these as best we can in, um, in this short space of time amount um in the chat what do people think is kind of is a recommended amount of sleep for a teenager if people wouldn't mind just kind of putting a hazarding a guess well roughly what they think hopefully the chat's working eight hours nine hours Eight to nine, ten, yeah, seven hours, ten hours for teens, seven, yeah, you're all pretty much exactly there. So school age, ages six to 13, nine to 11 is recommended. Uh, teenagers, 14 to 17, between eight and 10 hours. Young adults, 18 to 25, seven to nine hours. 
Um, so pretty much exactly, yeah, I think everyone was pretty much exactly spot on, which is great. Um, there is some science uh, and in the case that some people naturally need a, need a bit less sleep and some people need naturally need a bit more. Um, and we also say don't worry, kind of don't, if people start focusing too, too much on the hours they need to get get each night, um, that can feed into worry and actually the worry itself can have a bigger impact than the amount of hours. So it's kind of, that's an ideal, that's something to hold in mind, but don't kind of, you know, I think don't get too too worked up about it. And that's the same message for a young person as well. Uh, I think it's quite an interesting fact. So 70%, 2% of parents believe their teenagers are getting plenty of sleep. Uh, but when they actually looked at the, those teenagers, only 11% were, were actually getting the sleep they needed. Um, so I think it's great for those who are here. And there's probably a lot of parents out there who would probably benefit from being at a workshop like this because they probably believe their teens are getting enough sleep when they're probably not. Um, so that's just a, yeah, just a takeaway fact, which I think is quite interesting. OK, timing. Um, I put this picture. OK, so yeah, so essentially the main message here is that um, there's one of the things particularly for young people and teenagers is that there's evidence that during the teenage years, we're not sure why, but because of all the hormonal changes and puberty and everything else going on, there's meant to be a natural push where there's a push to go to sleep a bit later. Uh, so their natural sleep kind of um, sleep cycle and kind of body clock moves a bit later naturally as, as, a, as, a, as a whole. So they want to go to bed naturally a bit later and their body's kind of telling them to go to bed later and they want to wake up later in the morning. Um, and there's some, some evidence that's a general trend of, for teenagers. So actually it might be quite biological. Um, so that creates issues essentially with school because actually our school day currently as it's designed across the UK and many countries starts really quite early in the morning. So a lot of young people might really be struggling to get to sleep or kind of going to bed early enough to give themselves enough sleep. Um, and that can lead to essentially what we call a sleep debt. So actually on the weekend, their bodies are wanting to catch up because they've lost sleep because naturally their bodies aren't letting them go to sleep early enough in at night to get all the sleep they need. Um, so they've got this accumulated sleep debt on a weekend um, and their bodies will be trying to compensate. And many parents, understandably, will be kind of come on, get up, stop wasting the day. Let's start the routine like you do the school. But actually an amount of teenagers will be experiencing that sleep debt will actually need in some ways to catch up on an amount of that sleep um, on a weekend so that she, they can kind of catch up on an amount of that, that sleep debt. Um, Patricia, I'll come to that as a really good point. And I think actually, um, yeah, we can think through that. I think one thing to say, which I don't have on here about stages of sleep um, is, is actually that there's, there's earlier stages of sleep the, the brain is still actually conscious and is thinking um so an amount of young people or I, I i make this point a bit later but i'll make it now there's an amount of young people and anyone who has the belief that when we're sleeping our brains aren't going to be busy actually our brains are really busy during sleep because they're processing they're working things through from the day um and some of that sleep process an amount of it is conscious um, so they actually be awake and thinking, but actually in potentially stage one sleep, for example. Um, and there's other times like with a sleep cycle, it's usually about 90 minutes where they'd be waking up through the night and kind of in kind of times where they're thinking more. So I'm not saying that your Patricia, your daughter is sleeping when they're not, but there, there might be an amount of sleeping or processing what they're doing. Um, but they think they're essentially awake, but partly they're, they're in a sleep process, if that makes sense. Um, so just to put that out there as well in terms of sleep, the sleep cycle and stages of sleep. Okay, so we're going to talk now about kind of the best, current best ideas um, for supporting sleep. As I said before, some of them might come across as really obvious, but I'm hoping to kind of give at least a few um, that are a bit beyond kind of common sense sort of reasons why. Um, okay, so the number one thing really is that we are such creatures of habit and routine. 
Um, and this is even more important when it comes to sleep. We have a natural body clock or circadian rhythm and our body learns over time when to produce certain hormones like melatonin to trigger that this is the time to start winding down. And if our sleep's all over the place and our time to get sleep or is shifting about all the time, that body clock is just not going to learn and it's just going to get confused and anxious and stressed so it that routine and i know it's hard in our, all our busy lives but it is so important um and it's not just about the time we go to sleep it's actually about the whole routine that we create around sleep um, and the steps we go through in terms of winding down getting into bed what we do once we're in bed what our kind of room environment is and just to kind of make this point really clear and how you can say it to a teenager as well, just how important that habit and routine is. If for one night you were to go into your bed and turn the other way around to you normally do, or if you're sleeping in a bed with a partner, swap positions, notice and just think now about how hard it would be to sleep with even that very slight change in routine. Just It's just kind of remembering, actually, we are such creatures of habit that we really need to think about how we create a routine as best as possible that helps nurture sleep and reflecting and spending a bit of time and our team spending a bit of time thinking about their habit and routine and am I doing the things that would foster sleep as best as possible um, and am I helping set my um, body clock. Uh, so when we think about um, interventions or helping of sleep um, we don't tend to suggest changing the time you go to sleep as the first thing. We tend to suggest actually what we call anchoring the mornings first. Uh, and that, that basically that means is picking, especially during weekends or summer holidays as they're coming up, picking and agreeing a time in the morning that is the latest as a minimum that you're going to wake up. Um, and so that could be, you know, whatever it works for in your family. It might be nine, it might be 10, it might be 1030, whatever it is. But our bodies also, you know, in summer it's easier, but in winter it's much harder, need to experience and different hormones are kind of activated by experiencing light outside and seeing the light. So your teenagers dark rooms at 10 a.m., 11 a.m., 12 a.m. and 12 p.m. in the morning are not going to be helping set their body clock. Um, what they really need is some light at that time. Um, and, and essentially, once they've got that, they've got this kind of change in hormones in the morning from melatonin to kind of more your daytime kind of hormones and neurotransmitters going on. It's like a signal where this is daytime and my sleep cycle needs to adjust based on when I'm waking up. Um, so rather than going kind of focusing too much on you need to be asleep by 11, you need to be asleep by 10 or whatever it is, particularly over summer, I'd really kind of put out there of anchoring the mornings. Um, during winters, or if you're just a young person refusing to open the curtains, um, there are some products, I don't I don't think they're particularly cheap, unfortunately, but as the first one is, I think it's a Lumia light. So essentially you set a time on the alarm clock uh, and at that time, the light will gradually increase to kind of um, quite a, light room essentially uh, at the time that you've set it at so it actually helps with that process of your brain realizing okay this is daytime because that light is just so important um so those kind of products or just you know agreeing a time that you're going to gently go in and suggest or help open the curtains um if they allow you in the room and that such such situation but those kind of things can be really helpful and agreeing that with your young person um and kind of having it maybe as a bit of a family rule as well uh, caffeine, so we know that caffeine's a stimulant. We know that young people has huge issues with the amount of caffeine and energy drinks that young people are drinking nowadays. Sometimes some pe young people tell me and it really scares me. Um, but we also know that an amount of caffeine young people are having and it is a stimulant and it does help to a degree of performance. But because it's a stimulant, the recommendation is stopping in the um, from mid-afternoon onwards. Some adults might kind of... Um, be slightly more tolerant, especially if they're quite used to drinking quite a lot of coffee or such like. But the recommendation is for young people and adults, mid afternoon, about three o'clock latest caffeine stops and thinking, you know, actually about things like tea or even some decaf drinks, just checking how much caffeine they've got in them, because some decaf coffees or products 
but advertise themselves as decaf. It's, some of them are about half as much caffeine, which can still be quite a lot. Um, so just double checking that because that will keep your teenager awake and reduce the quality of their sleep. Um, I will say here, there's one, but a few that aren't on there and hopefully it's not too much of a problem in some of your families. But um, if young people are drinking, say, for example, alcohol, um, there's evidence that alcohol really disrupts sleep. Um, so actually, there's the, the old fashioned idea was that it kind of you know, kind of um, gets helps get people to sleep. Um, and sometimes there's that there is a sedative effect of alcohol. But what we also know is that um, uh, that it leads people to wake up a lot more in the night. They might not remember it, but they wake up a lot more in the night and their sheep sleep is a lot more shallow. So that kind of processing, helping to remember things um, function is kind of really diminished. Um, I know that everyone here, you know, some people might have some young people who are 18 in sixth form. Most of you will have young people. Who hopefully that isn't something, but I did want to mention it just in case it is something that's relevant for some of your young people. Um, temperature. So uh, I don't know if people knew this, but um, our, t our body temperature needs to be quite cold in order to fall asleep. So our whole body temperature needs to drop by a degree. Um, so the ideal room temperature is for the kind of exact temperature is meant to be around 18 degrees, which is quite cold. Um, and that's 18 degrees kind of around you, including kind of your, your duvet. So if you've got a super warm duvet on, you're probably not allowing that temperature to drop. Um, so you want to be comfortable, but it's on a cooler side. You want to kind of feel cool in order to um, find that ability to, for your body temperature to drop by about a degree, which is needed in order to kickstart sleep. Um, so just to let people know that there is that demand. So if you've got a very warm house or an electric blanket or your young person electric blanket, uh, that might be something that kind of keeps them up a bit. Um, someone mentioned about blackout curtains, really good, good advice as well in terms of that light in the mornings, dark at night, but hopefully if you need them, if you're, you're especially during summer and for the younger teens, if you can make the rooms dark with blackout blinds or blackout curtains, a uh, really good idea because it does help kind of that melatonin as well. Uh, Exercise is great. It really helps with sleep, but not just before bread. And they're saying about four hours before you go to sleep, preferably stop exercise. So, um, I mean, we that's not including things like yoga or your kind of low key or, you know, if you've got lucky enough to be a young person who meditates, which is very relaxing yoga, you've done very well. And um, that's not going to help uh, interrupt their sleep, but more your kind of intense hit workouts if they're into that or kind of long runs or fast runs. Um, it will keep them up for quite a bit of time. Um, so preferably as you're getting towards sleep, you're kind of tailing off exercise. Uh, there's mixed evidence about, I mean, there, there, there is some evidence that blue light is a bit better in terms of um, helping. So that kind of night mode that some of you might have heard about on your phone, it helps. Um, the, the overall recommendation is about half an hour to an hour before bed um, that kind of screens aren't particularly helpful. Um, but you need to pick your battles as parents. Um, and I know that lots of adults and young people we meet with now are on their phones quite a lot and are on their phones in their bed quite a lot. So while there's some evidence for kind of preferably 30 minutes to an hour before sleep off phones and preferably bed, being in bed isn't associated with um, stim, stim doing kind of active stuff on your phone. The other thing to say is that actually it's a lot about what they're doing on their phone. So there's quite so almost more important is are they doing something kind of relaxing, like a really boring brain, something that's a bit boring and brainless that's on their phone, in which case the evidence is it's not as bad. Or are they getting into arguments with their friends and talking about deep subjects just before falling asleep um, on social media, posting and doing something quite active? Uh, or trying to kind of get frustrated over playing Fortnite or Call of Duty, those things are going to have a lot more impact than something that's a, a lot more neutral, or essentially a bit more boring. Um, so worth thinking about, A, are they, you know, uh, what are they doing on their phone? And it, it, you know, you might need to negotiate middle ground um, for some of you. Hopefully they're, you know, not on their phones half an hour before sleep. Um, but is there a middle ground at least you could reach for something a bit more boring because they know that actually if they want to get better sleep and help with their day times and help with their performance at school, something a bit more boring is better. OK, so 
bottom hand corner is a picture. It looks like a juggling ball, but it's a bean bag. Um, when whenever people have sleep sleep difficulties, one of the key things we think about is what is associated with their bed. What do we mean by that? If when they're in bed, they're doing active stuff on the phone, daytime or nighttime or mornings. They've got their laptop in the, the phone, they've been studying in their bed. Uh, they're talking to all sorts of people and having all sorts of difficult conversations in their bed. They're having conflict with people maybe in their bed. They're eating their food in their bed and they're going on social media in bed. Bed is not going to be associated with sleep. Bed is not going to be associated with rest. So they can do some of those things, fine. Preferably get them on a beanbag or something that isn't the bed so that their bed can be associated with rest and sleep and a beanbag can be rest associated with doing fun things, active things, hopefully not too much conflict with friends, uh, eating food. Um, COVID has been terrible for this because a lot of young people have been having their laptops in bed and studying. So actually these associations have kind of been set in that actually bed has increasingly been associated with work or phone calls or emails for adults and young people. And we really need to undo it and undo it quickly because um, it's causing a lot of problems. So I think those associations and finding an alternative and most young people should be receptive to that, um, hopefully. But, you know, I'm fine with you doing X, Y and Z, but just so your bed's a place for kind of rest and sleep. Can we get you a comfy chair or a beanbag that you're willing to sit in? I'd hope that most young people nowadays would say, yeah, that's fine. I'll pick my colour or whatever. OK, or a gaming chair. I know lots of young people into their gaming chairs and things like that. OK, um, so this one more talks towards uh, actually insomnia. Um, uh, so we, we're not going to have time to fully go into insomnia, but insomnia is kind of your more kind of chronic disrupted sleep. Um, but what I'm going to do here is just map out uh, a common what we call like a vicious cycle of uh, kind of insomnia and kind of disrupted sleep. So in bed at night time. So when we, this is kind of from cognitive behavioural therapy, it's a way we look at the different parts of our experience when we're in bed. Uh, so let's say a teenager is in bed or an adult, same, very similar um, situation. And the kind of things that insomnia kind of thoughts might have or disrupted sleep thoughts is they get st you start really getting frustrated about sleep itself and worried about sleep itself. So I'm not going to be able to sleep tonight. I'm going to feel awful tomorrow. I'm not going to get the hours I need. Normally, like when we had the have the odd nights disrupted sleep, we might be worrying about something that happened in the day or something that's coming up tomorrow. But those problems often kind of change around. The reason why kind of sleep difficulties and insomnia can get stuck in a park is because we're worrying about sleep itself. And we, there's only so much we can do with sleep and control it. So we're kind of our brain gets stuck on it because it's quite a hard thing to kind of think through and resolve. Um, so what were we feeling if, when we we're having those thoughts? So lots of people might feel quite, you get build up of anxiety or frustration or feel starting to feel low over time or kind of feel really bad that it's not able to kind of work this through and get their sleep. Um, they might start feeling a fatigue. Uh, their, their brains might, you know, bodies might be starting to kind of having more adrenaline rather than melatonin at night. Um, and hyperreactive. So that's where things like uh, blackout blinds and maybe white noise machines are really important because if we're starting to have poor sleep, any sounds or creaks or things are going to make us really alert. Like we said before, that amygdala is more reactive. So we need to kind of as best as possible control the environment and kind of minimise any stimulation late at night. Um, obviously, in London, there's only so much you can control. But having a white noise machine or blackout blinds, so there's not too many kind of shapes or lights or random sounds can help with uh, with that, especially when we're getting poor sleep. Um, so the kind of unhelpful things we can start to do is checking the clock, getting frustrated and just kind of telling yourself, try to sleep uh, and ruminate or kind of engage with the worries um, too much. So. I'm really oversimplifying this, but this is just a few. If someone's getting stuck in that or your teen's getting stuck in that, here's a few key things to know. And then the ideal of what we might start working towards. So let's say so our teen's got the thought, I just can't stop. And someone said this before, I can't turn off my brain before sleep. How common is that? Or kind of racing thoughts before sleep. Our teens get might say that a lot of it is just, just thinking about so much stuff, especially during the teen years. Um, 
So a message for you to know as parents is our brain's not meant to be turned off when sleep. It's actually really active when it's sleep. It's processing things. It's recuperating. It's thinking things through. It's making sense of things. And that's its job. Um, so just to bust that myth that sleep's meant to be a switch where we suddenly kind of don't think about anything. Well, it would be glorious if it was that, but that's not actually the purpose of sleep. Um, and during the teen years and any age, our brains are quite active and it's doing things. Some nights might be more peaceful than others, but it's busy for a reason. Um, and the second key message is that paying attention to the worries about sleep just doesn't help. Um, and actually just accepting and telling ourselves, OK, these thoughts might be around. My brain's probably doing a good job processing this stuff. Um, I just let it I let these thoughts be around rather than kind of getting too stressed about them is is kind of ideal. And that's where kind of mindfulness and things like that can come in. Like I said before, knowing as parents and your teens, knowing that actually in the early stage of sleep, we're still conscious. We can still think. Um, so they might think they're not asleep, but actually part of them might be asleep or actually in those early stages. Uh, as we fall into deeper cycles or parts of sleep, um, some of them are less conscious and not conscious. Um, but then we move back to a stage that's conscious again. So through the night sleep, you're going to be conscious for a fair amount of it. Uh, oh, yeah. And the other thing that we can kind of control is um, our attention. So do we pay attention to these worries or do we move our um, focus to something that's really neutral and boring, whether that's uh a TV programme or a movie that we've seen a hundred times or a radio programme we know is incredibly boring or some mindful music where it's the sound of waves or something like that. Um, as long as it's something that's not feeding into the frustration, there's evidence that that can be helpful for and kind of, I think they did some research where people fall asleep about half an hour earlier when they pay attention to neutral things rather than things that are negative or negative thoughts. Um, the other tip that they say, this is a hard one to put in place and your team would have to be up for it, is that like we talked before, if too many awake things are getting associated with bed and if a young person or any of us are getting too frustrated or worked up when we're in bed, um, after 25 minutes of not falling asleep or not getting near falling asleep, they suggest move over to the beanbag or wherever it is and do something, um, whether that's a book or something, but preferably something of again neutral and boring as possible, but it's not boring enough that a teenager wouldn't want to do it, but would want to do it, but isn't too stimulating. Um, but if but get 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 basically move over somewhere else, do something that's a bit awake because you're awake and you're feeling quite awake. And once you're feeling tired again, then move back into bed and repeat that process if needed. So that's that's the um, advice uh, that they give. Um, Lovely, Patricia, like uh, listen to piano playing, so it helps, fantastic. Again, something not too stimulating, something we're just quite used to, something with a bit of rhythm and melody. OK, so back to the CBT cycle, how do, how do we eventually kind of work through that? So some suggestions of kind of supporting your teens kind of move towards these kind of, uh, this kind of cycle. Um, what's going through their minds? The message that they get to sleep when they get sleep their brain's processing and if they're still awake in 25 minutes, I can get out of bed and sit on my beanbag and do something for a little bit. Hopefully that will lead to more feelings, a bit more neutral, a bit more in control and a bit more relaxed. Um, what was going on in body? Hopefully more relaxed, learning a routine, setting their body clock. What things they can do? Mindfulness on a beanbag or before. Uh, Yoga, breathing, getting out of bed over to, after 25 minutes. So just very basic things that might give a bit more of a sense, uh, a sense of control. Uh, if your team's up to it, I'll send me slides. There's a couple of things that they might want to work through uh, or you want to work through with them. The younger, younger teens might be up for it. Just a bit of a sleep plan. Um, what should I avoid two hours of bed? Tips, um, caffeine, exercise, things like that. Um, what can I just help relax before bed? Their agreed time to turn screen type screens off, time to get into bed, what they're going to do if they can't sleep, what can they do if they have a nightmare? So I'm going to move to that in a minute as well. If a young, if a teen's struggling for quite a long time um, and adults as well, a couple of sleep diaries, so just ways to kind of keep track of their habits, what seems like it's helping sleep. These are so small, I don't expect you to read it, but if sleep's an ongoing problem and they're motivated enough, they might want to complete one of these, these worksheets uh, that helps them spot what might be 
feeding into their poor sleep. Um, so NHS sleep diary or CCI health sleep diary. Uh, I'm aware of time, but I'm going to carry on if it's OK, if people still OK, until about 20 past and hopefully we'll get through it by then. OK, a few quick uh, tips. So a couple of books, Good for Parents as Well, Why We Sleep, uh, Matthew Walker, Headspace, Mindfulness app. Uh, some of it is free of kind of quite nice, relaxing mindfulness. Uh, lots of people have lots of opinions about mindfulness, but actually there is good evidence that it helps with sleep. Uh, if sleep's getting uh, tricky, there's a lot of different brands of uh, apps. So like sleep cycle apps where you put your phone in your bed and it tracks kind of when you're getting to sleep and your different stages of sleep and tells you in the morning uh, with some advice on them too. So those are around uh, and every mind matters has some good advice too. So just a few links. Um, nightmares. So um, some young people might struggle with nightmares uh, if they ever have or wake up saying they're have, having nightmares. Uh, a few things that can be helpful. So, um, nightmares. Lots of people kind of um, don't know this, but you can actually have quite a lot of control over your nightmares. Um, so the way that we suggest trying, it doesn't work for everyone, but helps lots of people, is if you're starting to have nightmares or worried about having reoccurring nightmares, you identify kind of like what was the nightmare I was having, and where did it finish? What what point did it get up to? Um, and what was kind of the toughest point and what was I feeling? So a young person might be feeling scared when this happened in their nightmare for sharing with you. Um, and the question to ask yourself is what what would I prefer to feel in that moment of those bad moments of a dream? So probably kind of happy or relaxed. And then you tell yourself and practice or talk through with someone what would need to happen in the dream in order for me to feel relaxed or calm? So you start to practice for an alternative kind of ending to a dream that's completely creative. So mum or dad or a friend comes into the dream or a character from a TV programme does this, 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 and I end up feeling relaxed. And the evidence is for lots of young people and adults is actually when we do then go to sleep because we've pre-practiced it, our dreams tend to actually recreate that ending. Um, so just a tip for some young people is that you can actually have some control over your dreams sometimes. Uh, and there's a worksheet there that kind of is essentially what's on the screen that's available for free. Um, so moving towards the final kind of quick message for today is that actually, particularly over summer, um, what we do in our days is also going to uh, influence our sleep time. If So if over summer our teens are not doing much, their sleep's going to get disrupted because they don't have much to process or there might not be much going on. Uh, and they might not be doing much exercise. So actually, if they're not doing much in the day, that will impact their sleep and their sleep is also going to impact their day, which is why I want to talk very briefly about what's called a summer self-care plan. Uh, don't need to go into too much detail, but just to kind of tell you that it's out there and you and your teens could have a look at it and think about it. Um, Self-care, what can we do to help ourselves feel better and keep ourselves feeling as good or OK as possible? And everyone's approach to self-care will be different and it's important for all of us. Um, so basically, Anna Freud is a website um, specialising in well-being and mental health, and they've designed what's called a summer self-care plan. And they talk about these four areas are physical well-being, emotional well-being, social and practical. And it's a guided kind of resource that asks people to come up with two or three ideas and that for over summer of their plan of how they're going to look after themselves over summer in practical ways, in physical ways, so through exercise, um, emotional ways, so what they're going to do to support themselves or kind of um, what they're going to focus on over summer, uh, and also kind of their social kind of social lives over summer as well. And the idea is it's just giving a bit more focus to summer so that they're still working on goals and they're still kind of focusing on things so that summer doesn't hopefully become too much pure video games or pure laying in bed or pure watching Netflix all day where just things get too out of sync and then September comes around and it's just really, really challenging for them. Um, and going back to what we talked about earlier, that's also why I'd really put that message over of anchoring the mornings and setting that minimum time for you agree as a family that's wake up time with a bit of light coming in the room, hopefully. Um, so the link's there for that. Um, and yeah, I'll put the slides up as well and they'll be on the school websites as well uh, for you to look back at. Um, so and I'll post the links in the chat as well. 
so just to mention now, I'm, I'm just going to repost something very quickly because we're coming towards the end. I'm posting in the chat um, and we'll give some time for Q&A's at the end. Uh, a 20, 30 second feedback questionnaire. It's really helpful. We've, this is a, we've updated this workshop, so it'd be really helpful just here if it feels useful, if there's anything we can change about it. It just takes 20, 30 seconds on the link in the chat. Um, I wanted to let you know briefly about the support available in all the secondary schools. So um, Wimbledon College, Rains Park and Ursuline. Uh, so all the schools have pastoral care. Um, our service is the Education Wellbeing Practitioner Service. It includes that wellbeing support in schools. Um, so we support young people with um, and common anxieties or low mood, uh, kind of early help support. And all your team needs to do is fill out a one page form. Um, they can do it themselves. They can ask a teacher to do it on their behalf. You can do it as a parent um, and send it to us. And we offer a kind of eight week guided self-help program on if they're struggling with anxiety, stress or low mood uh, following kind of CBT ideas. Uh, any young person can get uh, counselling support through COOF, which is an online counselling um, platform. Equally in Merton, we've got access to offer record counselling. Being honest, I think off record is great. They also have quite a, they have a bit of a waiting list, um, like lots of services do, but young people can self-refer as well. Um, CAMS obviously provides more specialist support if someone's really struggling with their mental health uh, and referral can come from a GP or school. Uh, there's also some numbers here uh, if any kind of for anyone and young people to use at any time if they ever want some support. Uh, we have a YouTube channel, so there's lots of videos and workshops from past workshops that are on there. So you're very welcome to have a look. We've got topics around motivation, self-harm, school based anxiety, feeding difficulties, all sorts of things on there. So you're very welcome to have a look um, and have access to that. Um, and that's it for today. So really, thank you so much for joining this evening. Um, I hope. Yeah, I hope everyone and some, some people have taken at least a few things away from the session. Uh, if anyone's got any questions in the chat, I'm happy to do my best at answering some questions. But thank you very much for joining uh, and please put in some feedback in the um, questionnaire if you've got the chance. Thank you. Pleasure. No worries at all. That was really good. Thank you. Pleasure. It's a lot to cover in 45 minutes, but hopefully, um, yeah, hopefully we had a whistle stop. Okay, thank you very much. I'll I'll complete the question. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. No problem, pleasure. Bye. Hi Joshua, just one question. Yeah, of course. Sorry. Are you are you able to send the slide across to us? Yeah, what I'm going to try and do is put them in the chat. I know there's been problems with it before. Um, so if it doesn't work, what I'll do is I'll put it on. I'm going to put it on YouTube and then I can send it around in an email link as well. So one way or another, you'll have access to the video and the slides. OK, thank you very much. That's perfect. Pleasure. Thanks a lot. No problem. All right. Cheers. Bye.